Happy Halloween, book lovers. Uh, playing in the background is a, a little Bela Bartok. Music for strings, percussion, and Celesta. Uh, second movement. Anyway, I'm going to shut that down. Hold on. And uh, the book we're doing today, it's not really a book, it's more of a pamphlet, um, is, is this zine-like um, publication called The American Mainstream by Matt Seneca. Um, and uh, Matt Seneca is a, uh, is a writer and he's a cartoonist, but I think, well, for me, he's better known as a writer. And um, what I really know him for is, uh, is being a, uh, one of the hosts of uh, one of my favorite podcasts, Comic Books Are Burning in Hell. And I think that's where I heard about American Mainstream. And it's a, um, even though the cover appears to be baseball players engaged in a brawl, um, it has nothing to do with baseball. So I'm, I'm drinking my herbal tea here. So anyway, what it does have to do with is uh, what are, weirdly enough, in my opinion, called mainstream comics in the comics world. Mainstream comics have ultimately come to mean superhero comics. And I realize that for most people, superhero comics just are comics. Comics equals superhero comics. But within the world of comics, superhero comics are important, but not really the be-all and end-all. Certainly not for me. I think, I think anyone who reads my blog knows that about me. But he uh, he decided he wanted to write about them and, and write. He wrote this pamphlet, a short pamphlet, and um, my uh, my motivation for reading it, besides the fact that I really like uh, his podcast, um, comic books are burning in hell, is that uh, I I don't know. I just thought the comic books are burning in hell has a such a uh, irreverent attitude course talking about comics although they are strongly strong believers in comics as art and they love art comics and and I'll actually be talking in a future episode about one that they considered uh, one of the top 10 of the past decade called grip but today we're just talking about this uh, this essay by Matt Seneca and uh, he wrote some I'm going to just quote him because it, uh, uh, it, it tells a lot. It, it's, it explains a lot about how superhero comics became uh, kind of so ubiquitous. The lucky combination of an industry of skilled craftsmen who grew up watching their art form coalesce into a global visual language, a comma, a robust economy, and publishing field, comma, and a superheroic idiom wonderfully suited to the medium of deliver delivery birthed an icon. It gave America a lasting, specific impression of the comics form itself that has now endured a few generational takeovers. This impression, of course, has shackled the medium's ability to grow for as long as it existed, but it's worth thinking about the power of the thing itself and how it's built. Um, and then he, let me continue the next paragraph. The essential artifacts of comics mid-century superheroes boom, uh, the quote, key issues, unquote, featuring since filmed characters might as well not exist at this point. Overvalued and auctioned into financial inaccessibility, available only in slick and garishly recolored collections, yoked to their own status as pop culture icons, they're as much museum pieces as they are 20-page narratives. So he's basically saying you, you can't get Spider-Man number one. It's too expensive. It's, it's, it's as expensive as a work of art in a museum, even though these aren't in museums. They're almost all in private hands. And, you know, 
for me personally, who cares? I mean, they're, they, they've been there, they're to, 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 you know, quote Walter Benjamin, they are works of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. They've been reproduced and reprinted over and over again. I don't have to own Superman 1 or Action Comics 1 or Spider-Man 1 to read the stories in them because I can easily get them. And at this point, I can probably get them for free online. Um, and in any case, um, what he decided to do was look at, uh, at comics from the point of view of um, what he thought of as key issues, even though in the history of comics, they're not... They're not key uh, in the sense that they they're not like the the future of comics aren't aren't built on them. But for him, they're they're ones that were key because partly because he decided they were, but also partly because he was able to to pick them up. They were they were relatively inexpensive, and um, and they uh, they point a way forward for comics. The first issue he talks about. Is a uh, Captain Easy number fifteen by Roy Crane and Leslie Turner uh, from uh, nineteen forty nine, and what's weird is Captain Easy was a comic strip that had was defunct. I mean, Roy Crane was the the creator of Captain Easy, and it's a great comic strip and one of my all time favorites. But it it disappeared because. Uh, Roy Crane made a better deal with a different syndicate and started a new strip called Buzz Sawyer. So, by the time uh, it was published, 1949, the comic book was published, the strip hadn't been around for like, I don't know, six or seven years. Excuse me. But, he, uh, I guess, was still involved in the, um, the comic book, and it was drawn by his uh, studio assistant, a guy named uh, Leslie Turner, and it's not important. It's not a superhero comic because uh, Captain Easy is it's more of a swashbuckling adventure guy. But from Seneca's point of view, Captain Easy sort of points the direction of of superheroes when it, it appears as a comic strip, and then gets imitated by a bunch of uh, other really good artists like uh, Milton Kniff, for example, who does uh, Terry and the Pirates. And other artists who do adventure comic strips. And then when the superhero comics appear, they basically spin off what those other artists created. What, uh, you know, uh, Prince Valiant and, and strips like that. Or Flash Gordon. And um, so he, said, he, he, he identifies Roy Crane and Captain Easy as sort of the er uh, comics of superhero comics. And there's a lot to it. I mean, it is, although when they began, they were, they were humorous jazz age adventures. There's a lot of like, you know, truth, justice in the American way happening. Um, so that, that's the main, I mean, and also the drawing, uh, uh, Leslie Turner's drawing in this comic book, which is really a close imitation to the way Roy Crane drew it. Um, you can see that style being uh, replicated throughout the history of superhero comics. The next one he picks is from 1962. And by 1962, okay, superhero comics started out in the, the late 30s. They were quite popular in the, um, in the 40s. But then they, they almost completely died out in the 50s. Although Superman and Batman kept being published. But then in the late 50s, uh, DC Comics revived them. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they had great success doing that. And that was sort of the rebirth of uh, superhero comics. It started off with a revival of, of a 1940s character called The Flash. And then uh, in 1962, uh, Rip Hunter Time Master number 7 was published. And in this case, it's uh, drawn by Alex Toth, and uh, Jack Miller's a writer. And um, Rip Hunter has su subsequently become a figure folded into 
the DC Comics universe and into the, the DC television universe as well. But uh, at this point, he was just sort of an adventurer who had access to a time machine. And, uh, and he, Seneca basically critiques it as being terribly written, that none of the characters are distinguished from one another. And, and Alex Toth, the, the, the artist who drew it, he was an amazingly skilled artist. And, uh, and as Seneca writes, his, uh, his drawing and, and design of, of this comic, this one comic that he's talking about, so outpaces the writing. And actually, that, that, that particular scenario pops up again and again. Um, because, you know, write, writing wasn't considered an important thing. Uh, it wasn't really... In retrospect, uh, comics fans can, can identify the writers that they thought were good, but most comic writers were terrible, especially after the comics code came in because most of the good writers, you know, fled for greener pastures as soon as uh, comics established its own self-censorship regime. Then we skip ahead to uh, um, 1965 with Thunder Agents Number 1 by Wally Wood with uh, Reed Crandall, Gil Kane, uh, Mike Sikowski, Dan Atkins, Larry Ivey, Lou Silverstone, and Lynn Brown. And Wally Wood was a, a very successful co cartoonist in the, the EC Comics days and in the early days of Mad Magazine. And he kind of burned his bridges with Mad and then, uh, then went to Marvel for a little while. And um, he, he, he was pretty successful drawing for Marvel but I think he, he burned out there too because, I don't know, he just didn't fit into the culture. Although he did design the uniform for a superhero named Daredevil that is sort of iconic. And so he, he could see around him in the mid-60s that the popular comic books right then were uh, superhero comic books. And so he wanted to get in on this. And so the Thunder agents were his attempt to do a superhero team. And and so Seneca writes about how the, uh, the art is uh, totally overwhelms the writing. And in this case, Wood is writing it. And he says the same thing. Wood, Wood was not a good writer. The plot was stupid and the, the characters were flat. But his drawing, it's amazing. But it wasn't really right for comics. The, the really successful comics artists uh, who were doing um, superhero comics were much more expressive and energetic. People like Jack Kirby, obviously. And, uh, and, and Wood was more moody and, um, and classical in a way. And we'll see a little bit of that. And then he does a, another... Um, Wally Wood comic called uh, Heroes Inc. Presents Canon, where Wood uh, inks uh, Steve Ditko, weirdly enough. And Steve Ditko was was uh, the creator of Spider-Man and and pretty much the creator of Doctor Strange. And he he was a great artist. He died uh, just recently. Um, but And he was a cantankerous artist. But he also burned his bridges with Marvel. He couldn't stand Stan Lee. Stan Lee was a, a glory hog. And so he, when Ditko jumped ship, Wood offered him some work. And many others did too. But Canon was a uh, kind of an adventure strip, not a superhero strip. And he, it had a, actually kind of a longish life because it ended up getting published by the U.S. Army, oddly enough, for uh, one of their overseas publications. Um, but then, at the same time, he did another superhero strip called The Misfits, which was a um, kind of a takeoff on, on a not terribly successful uh, DC strip called Doom Patrol, 
of literal misfit superheroes that don't quite live up to any sort of heroic ideal. But that allow him to have some fun with some sort of psychedelic page layouts. Then uh, Seneca jumps to 1971 with The Forever People number 6 by Jack Kirby. Uh, Kirby writing and drawing it. Uh, published by DC. Now, I, I've, I've talked about this before uh, on my blog. Kirby was a was burned out with Marvel. Marvel was occasionally would offer him uh, a hint of equity, which you know he deserves since he created pretty much eighty percent of what made the money. And then, uh, when uh, it came time, when they were about to sell the whole company to, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, Cadence Industries, I think. He, Kirby was not included in the deal, and he should have been. So he said, you know, fuck you guys, and he walked. And DC welcomed him with open arms because, you know, they'd been having their asses handed to them for years by Marvel. And here was, uh, you know, the architect of Marvel willing to come over and do his own comics for DC. And, and these comics that he did... Um, the uh, fourth world, as he calls them, but uh, forever people was part of that. They have absolutely become a part of uh, the DC universe, and I should add the DC cinematic universe. Uh, the main villain of uh, of the first Justice League movie was a character from that Jack Kirby created, for example, um, and. And that, I, I hate to say it, that's how you judge, how people in the world judge the value of these characters, whether or not they were, it was, anyone was able to turn them into media properties. If, in other words, whether anyone was able to financialize them. So Kirby's, and, and Kirby and his family ended up getting some of the, the money from, uh, that was due to them from Marvel, but Kirby was dead by the time that happened, unfortunately. Then at the end, uh, Seneca looks at some specific panels and specific issues. And one issue he, or one page he looks at is a, an issue of Daredevil by Wally Wood. And, and this issue, uh, I, I remember it well. Uh, even though it came out in 1965 when I was two years old. Uh, the Submariner decides to declare war on the surface world. He was always sort of a ambiguous hero. And, uh, and he wants to sue the surface world, so he hires Matt Murdock, the lawyer, who is uh, Daredevil's human uh, alter ego. And... Uh, but in this page, Daredevil doesn't appear. It's just a submariner walking amongst humans and and causing fear and destruction. And Seneca sort of uh, um, fam says, okay, you know, it's kind of a perfect page. Uh, it's full of uh, heavy, thick blacks and, uh, and, and kind of a ominous-looking perspective of the Submariner's back as he's walking through the crowd. But it's just not, it's not dynamic the way uh, Kirby is. I mean, I think Wally Wood was uh, five times the, uh, the raw talent that Kirby was. But Kirby had a look that just was just perfect for superhero comics. Anyway, so it doesn't really have, uh, I'm sorry. American mainstream doesn't really have a, th a major thesis or axe to grind. It's just Seneca writing about how a bunch of different varied comics uh, came together uh, and uh, created something so valuable to uh, our corporate overlords that that's what people think of when they hear the word comics. 
just actually kind of amazing when you think about it. It would be as if um, when anyone heard the word movies, they thought of westerns. And the entire history of cinema outside of westerns was kind of a footnote. That's how people view comics, superhero comics at least. Anyway, this was a, a pamphlet. Uh, I, I ordered it, and I, I, I see that it, on the, the order page, that, which I will include my link, that is out of print already, which is not surprising. I, it looks like uh, Seneca probably printed it himself at his local Kinko's. And um, and then uh, I took it with me this morning when I went for a walk to the park, uh, Baldwin Park in Houston, Texas. And sat under the big oak trees and, and read it. And then uh, when I was done with it, I read another book that I'm working on, an, a biography of Eve Klein, which will be a subject of a future uh, book report. But anyway, this is all I have to say about uh, this book. Check out um, Seneca's podcast, um, Comic Books of Burning in Hell. It's a good one. And uh, read more zines. <laughs>